Our next speaker is Mabel Ong, and the topic is building a Ruby web app using the Ruby standard library. Do you want to understand how a web application works without Rails magic? Let's go back to the basics of the web application and build one from the ground up using Ruby standard library. After this session, you'll appreciate Rails that much more. And about our speaker, Mabel is yet another software developer who made it without a formal education in CS. She currently works at the Truffle Ruby team at Shopify, where speedy Rube code isn't a fantasy. <laughs> Previously, Maple worked on Backwork, a Ruby gem to enforce modularity in Rails applications. You will find our lovely speaker at Twitter by from handle using handle on Mabel, but we drop this to stream chat. Mabel, the floor is yours. Oh, hello there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the talk. Uh, today, we'll be building a web app using Ruby. I was just kidding about that. I would not, you know, look at my phone in real life. So, so just to be clear, uh, this talk is uh, not how to build a web app for your startup. You can just use Rails. They have awesome guides. Uh, this is also not a tutorial on how to write Ruby code because I'm going to assume that you have some experience um, reading and writing Ruby code already. And lastly, we're not going to go into complex uh, web application concepts. This is going to be a foundational talk. So uh, with that being said, we'll learn about networking protocols. So IP and TCP, HTTP messaging and data store and persistency. So just a quick introduction to me. My name is Maple. Um, this is the picture that we have off on the site. I'm actually not that serious in real life. Um, right now I live in Waterloo, uh, Ontario, Canada. It's around an hour away from Toronto. Um, so I don't have a CS degree. I actually went to school for health sciences and only learned programming in my last year of undergrad. Uh, but I currently work uh, on the Code Foundations team at Shopify, which with a bunch of cool people. Uh, more specifically, I work on Truffle Ruby. Um, Truffle Ruby, if you didn't know, is a high uh, performance Ruby implementation, very much like MRI or JRuby. Um, it's built on the uh, Truffle language implementation and uh, framework and GraalVM. Essentially, what we're trying to do is uh, optimize it on production level code, which is pretty fun. Outside of work, I really enjoy working out and training, uh, which is why I chose our web app today to be a step tracker. So this is what we'll be building today. If you are a fitness enthusiast like me, you will know that tracking your daily steps is a good way to do informal cardio, especially if you don't enjoy cardio very much. Um, I'm also team 10,000 steps a day, at least. Um, you can find me walking on my under desk treadmill during meetings. Um, so obviously I'm no designer, but to, the point of this is to keep it super simple and we're going to try to focus on the concepts of um, web applications and keep it simple, silly. <laughs> so what we want our web app to do is to record the date and the amount of steps per day and display it on the main page for uh, everyone to see. So right before we begin, quick disclaimer, uh, I won't be able to cover every single detail in this talk. However, I highly encourage you to dig into documentation and source code by yourself. If you're curious about any detail I've mentioned, um, I will also be sharing the link to the link to the slides and the slides will contain, um, you know, links I found helpful when I was writing this talk. So let's get started and start down low how applications communicate. So just like humans use languages to speak, computers do the same, just using various levels uh, of communications protocol. So at the lower end of the networking stack, we have the internet protocol, uh, which is within the network layer. We have TCP uh, um, within the transport layer. And then on top of that, we have HTTP 
um, within the application layer. So we'll be talking about all three layers in this talk. So within the IP level or the internet protocol level, little packets are delivered from the source to the destination, your computer. And that's basically how you get the internet. That's a while, right? Um, IP packet delivery is generally unreliable though, because it might take different uh, network routes to get to the destination. And even then packets might arrive out of order. So to overcome this unreliability issue, two protocols were created and one of them was TCP. Uh, in order to create a more stable and reliable network, uh, the other one is UDP. But for this talk, we'll focus on TCP because that's how our web application server communicates with the client. The TCP provides a layer of instructions on top of IP to be more reliable, as I mentioned. And for example, the sender can um, add an incrementing number with each IP packet and the packets are then uh, reassembled in order once they arrive at the destination. TCP uh, also provides a level of error control where a mandatory field is sent and then checked for corruption at its destination. Um, the protocol then is able to throw out any packets if it's corrupted so that you know we or the web application won't have to worry about handling any corrupted data. So in order to use TCP, uh, we have to first establish a connection between the host and the client through a port. There's actually a directory of port numbers for different types of applications. So for example, uh, the port number for simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP is 25. Um, so that's the port number used to connect to an email server. There's actually a link to the directory in the slides if you're curious about that. So in order for a TCP connection to occur between the web application, which is your backend, and then the client, which is the browser, a socket must be created. And that's how a server listens for incoming connections. So once a connection is established between the server and client, the socket turns into a client socket. A client socket is then how the server can share information with the client and vice versa. So let's try writing this in Ruby. So thankfully, a Ruby library called Socket exists a uh, socket is the library that talks to the TCP implementation built into the uh, operating system and provides us with a good API to create sockets. So let's take a look at our first code example. Uh, the goal is to write a service that returns the same information uh, as the input to the client, but louder. So let's walk through it. First, we'll require uh, the Ruby library socket. Uh, and we'll use the TCP, uh, TCP server class to create a TCP server at port 9999. Um, in a loop, we'll accept any connections to the server. Um, and once the uh, connection is established, um, it's assigned to the client variable, which represents a client socket. So after that, we'll create another while loop that um, takes in any lines of text from the socket and through the get method, and add some exclamation points to it and then spit it back to the client with a put, put statement. And then after that, we close this client socket and that's the end of the loop. So let's try to run, let's run this and then use netcat to connect to it. So uh, netcat is a command line tool. Um, it's a command line tool for TCP client and we can create TCP connections using netcat just from uh, the terminal. So we're going to use uh, netcat or nc uh, to connect to the server. So you can see here, I'm just running uh, the file with the code that we just wrote. And here we're connecting using netcat to the local host, which is where the server is hosted and then the port number. And then we're just going to enter some text and you can see it returns with the exclamation points. Um, so, Now that we have a way of communicating with the rest of the world, let's go a level higher. So just for the record, again, uh, we're sending messages to the client socket, but it's not really um, a web client or a browser. So let's see how we can actually send messages to a browser this time. So think about what we have right now. You can essentially send and receive streams of information or bytes between uh, the server and the client, 
But since that information can literally be anything, you can see that there might be an incompatibility problem. So um, we can have a browser client read and write information to the server, but if other servers all deliver their information in a different structure or way, um, we're gonna have a problem because now the browser doesn't, how would a browser communicate with all those other servers? There has to be a standardized way of sending and receiving information. We can't just stream the packets through TCP. There must be a way to structure that information. And that's where HTTP was born. Uh, HTTP or hypertext uh, transfer protocol is yet another layer on top of our network stack. In fact, we're now in the application layer and it's called the application layer because HTTP messages come directly to and from the application. Um, the HTTP protocol is built on top of um, application agnostic TCP, meaning that TCP can be used in any type of application and not just the web. Uh, TCP is also implemented in the operating system, as I mentioned before, but we can actually implement uh, HTTP in Ruby. And just for the record, there are definitely Ruby libraries out there, such as NAT, HTTP, uh, we can use to implement HTTP, but we're just doing it ourselves because we're going to learn about it and we're going to like learning about it. Um, one important note that really helped me understand uh, what HTTP was and cleared up a lot of confusion when I was learning it is that HTTP actually does not represent any physical code. Instead, it's just a description of uh, the structure of the message that everyone agreed to use as a standard. Um, HTTP is a specification. And we use the code to parse and structure the message according to the specifications of the protocol. So HTTP communication can be broken down into two types. So requests and responses. Um, a client can make a request to the server and then the server can return with a response. But every single HTTP message has the same structure. So it starts with a start line. Um, header fields, it can be zero more, a blank line, and then an optional message body that usually contains the HTML code. So um, I guess I really want to explain why there's an alien being there, but I mean, after I talked about the structure, maybe you can see why I drew that alien there. Um, so the difference between the uh, request and response message is actually at the start line, so the first line. Um, the start line for requests is called the request line, and then the start line for the responses are called the status line. Um, so here we have an example of the start line for both uh, requests and responses. The request line for HTTP can be broken down into the method token, uh, the request path, and the HTTP ver version. So in this example, you can see that the method token is get, the request path is hello there, and an HTTP version is 1.1. So there are several types of uh, method tokens or what we call request methods. Uh, the ones we'll be using in this talk is get and post. A get request is when an information is requested from the server, while a post request is when an information is sent back to the server or posted to the server um, and somehow maybe modifies the database. Um, there are also other types of methods such as put and delete. Um, so go moving to uh, HTTP response, the status line uh, in an HTTP response can be broken down into the version number of HTTP that somehow comes first, um, <laughs> the numeric status code, uh, in this case is 200, and then the status description, which is okay. So there are other status codes as well. The most common, <laughs> common one is 404 error or 404 page not found. Um, you probably remember it because it's very frustrating to see it. Um, the number itself actually categorizes the type of statuses. So uh, for example, status codes 200 or larger indicates a success, 300 or larger indicates a redirection to perhaps a different page, 400 or larger indicates a client-side error, and lastly 500 or larger indicates a server-side error. Um, like a, time, a server timeout. So let's take a look at a real example of um, an HTTP request. Um, so we can get this by using netcat again with the L flag to listen for uh, any incoming 
connections. So in this case, we're, lo- we're listening on localhost at port 9999. Okay, so, so this is a request and you can see the first line, uh, it's a post request to the target path uh, add data, and then the HTTP version is 1.1. And then you see a bunch of header fields that look very familiar structurally. You can see that um, it's the header name, colon, space, and then the value of the header. It's very much like a Ruby hash. And lastly, we have a blank line and then a message body. So let's move on to our next code uh, sample we'll try to receive and send simple HTML. So HTML is another way to describe a formatted and interactive document using plain text. Uh, just like the browser knows how to use the HTTP protocol, um, it also knows how to parse and display HTML to the users. Let's um, take a look. So don't feel overwhelmed. We're going to go through it. Um, but the goal, as I said before, is to accept and parse a request and then send it back to the browser um, to display the simple HTML. So the first thing we want to do is um, instead of just reading uh, the client in, uh, input, we're actually going to take it because we know it's coming from a, a browser now and split it up into our uh, three items for the start line. So that's the method token, uh, the target and the HTTP version number. Oopsie. Okay, next, uh, we're gonna decide what to do with it because now we have the method token and a target. Um, so in the case where the method token is a get request and the target is show data, which is gonna be our main page, we are gonna craft the respond, response message to say, hello world um, in HTML header one. And for any other uh, combination of method token and target, we're going to say it didn't hit any endpoints and shrug. Um, and we're going to put together uh, the HTTP response because now we know what the response message is going to be. So you can see here, it's exactly the same structure as uh, we've seen before. The first line is the status line, which is HTTP 1.1, status code 200, OK. The content type is text uh, HTML. There are diff other different content types and also header fields that you can attach with your HTTP response, but we're not gonna go into it. Um, and lastly, we have a blank line and then the response message. So, oh, and we're also gonna return it to the client and then closing the socket. So here we have uh, the demo for this code after it's run. So we're gonna go to localhost just the port number without any path, and we'll see didn't hit any endpoints because it wasn't the one that we wanted. We're gonna try an extra path, still nothing, and then we're gonna try show data, with, which is our main page, and then you'll see hello world. So now that we have a structure for our app, let's allow users to input some data, uh, more specifically some steps and dates and the date, and then display it on the site. But how can we allow users to input data and send it to the backend? The most simple way is to use an HTML form. Um, we won't be going to details about how the form element looks like and how it works. But as mentioned previously, I've linked the resources for you to dig into. Um, so first, before we go into it, let's take a step back and see how the flow would look like. So when the user first goes on the website, um, let's say the main page where the information is requested um, with a GET request to the server. The server then responds with a form for the browser to display. The user then in inputs uh, new user information and then it's sent back to the server with a POST request. And then lastly, the server responds with an updated browser page uh, containing the new data. Let's walk through the code sample now. All right, so now we're actually gonna create some default data in a variable called all data. It's gonna be an array of hashes and the hashes will contain the, uh, the date and the step count as keys. And we're also gonna define a method called daily steps form, which is basically the HTML for the form. Um, the form action, which it will be the target path, in this case is add data when the request is made um, and the method is a post request 
And lastly, the encoding type is how the form data is going to be encoded when it's sent to the server in the request. So in this case, we're going to use uh, www form URL encoded. So moving on. Now that we have a variable storing all the data at the top, now we can display it. When a GET request is made, what we're doing here is taking all data, which is a variable containing all our data, and parsing the array uh, and create um, a response message with, uh, with the data and organize it as an HTML unordered list. So um, essentially, we're just displaying the data saved within the all data variable. So this is new. Here, we are creating a new endpoint, which is going to be a post request at, uh, at the target uh, add data. And here, we'll also set the status code to 303c other because we want to redirect the page back to the main page uh, once, the, once the user um, enters new information. Um, excuse me. So what we want to do now is parse the header fields from the request and put it within um, a hash called headers. The most relevant uh, part of this headers hash for us right now is the content length key, which represents the size of the request message body in bytes. Let's quickly refer back to our HTTP request example here. You can see that the content length header is 34 bytes. And the message body below is 34 bytes long. So you can pause the video to count it, but you can also take my word for it. Uh, this reason why we care about this content length header is so that the application can accurately know the size of the body and stop receiving the request once we've gotten the entire message. So also, uh, I want to point you towards the structure of the uh, message body here. It's in the www form encoding we've previously set the form to. Um, the variables here are separated by an ampersand sign. Right. So back to our post endpoint. So once we're able to uh, get the message body using the content length header, we have to decode the message. So um, the method we're using here is from the URI Ruby library. And the method is decode www form, uh, which conveniently decodes the message for us into an array of key values. So after we get, got the decoded message, we're just going to store it in the uh, all data variable that we have. And lastly, um, we're going to hard code the location header into our HTTP response for simplicity. Uh, it's just, it just means that we're going to redirect to the main page uh, after every single uh, HTTP response. So now let's run the code. You can see that um, I'm running the code that we uh, just wrote and then going to the main page, show data. Um, we now can see the HTML form. We're going to enter a date and then a step count. You got zero steps today. That's cool. And that's it. Um, so our app works. But let's see what happens in this new GIF. So you can see here, there's a bunch of entries already. I'm going to stop the server, um, refresh to make sure it's soft, run the server again, and then refresh the browser. And you can see that the steps are gone. Um, probably not the best idea to run this in production, obviously. So why though? This is because we are just only storing the data in memory and that's not persistent. So where can we store the data then? A database that's way too hard and complicated. Let's store it in everyone's favorite file type, a YAML file. Only if you're a human though. Um, so, I mean, we could use a plain text file instead of a YAML, but then we'll have to implement our own way of representing Ruby data items in plain text. And we want to keep it simple, silly. So we're just going to, use YAML store, um, which is a Ruby library um, that helps us serialize and deserialize Ruby objects to and from the YAML files. So let's dive the into the code. This is going to be a short one. Um, all we have to do, create a YAML store uh, and um, create a new file called store.yaml that contains our previous default step count entry. So under the get endpoint, um, what we want to do is read from the file. So we'll create a transaction 
using the store and attain the step data from the file and store it within the all data variable. So by the way, transaction a transaction is just how we read and write data um, to the YAML store and it's part of the API. So for our post endpoint, we want to uh, write to the YAML file. So we create another transaction and just shove all the user, the new user input into the daily steps hash from the file. And uh, the store will update the file accordingly. And voila, we're done. We've created um, a basic web application using Ruby um, and only Ruby libraries. Um, any user input data now will be persistent because it is stored within the YAML file uh, and if you want to read any data, we'll also be reading it from the ML file. So everything is good. So today we've learned about TCP sockets and uh, how to form connections between client and server, um, receiving HTTP requests and sending HTTP responses, um, and how to store data persistently in a file. Um, I feel like these are all fundamental concepts that you will see at a higher level abstract of abstraction when working day to day. So for example, when you're working on Rails. Um, and plus these concepts can be applied to other programming languages and web frameworks as well, and not just Ruby and Rails. So as you can tell from the code I've shared, um, writing out everything manually is a huge pain in the back end. Uh, if you don't believe me, try writing a, a legit web application, maybe, you know, a blog, only using uh, Ruby libraries and tag me in it because I would love to take a look. It's a really great educational experience though. So what's next though? There's a spoiler alert. Uh, there are more layers to the Ruby ecosystem that will help you build your web application. So for example, you can refactor your web application to be a Rack application. Rack is a web server interface on top of HTTP and very similar to HTTP because it's just a set of specifications. So Rack, the interface, Rack is the interface for a uh, web service such as Puma and Unicorn. So once you've refactored the app to be a Rack application, you can hand off the HTTP uh, logic uh, to the web servers. So you don't have to write them yourself. So you can also use an actual database such as SQLite if, or uh, MySQL instead of storing data in a YAML file. Um, if you're gonna do this uh, as a learning experience, I highly recommend using SQLite because it's much simpler and there's a Ruby gem for it. Um, so using a database will provide you uh, with the read and write optimizations for when you're dealing with a large amount of data. And obviously lastly, we have Ruby on Rails. Um, which contains the all-in-one framework to build a Ruby web application. So if you use Rails, you won't have to worry about Rack or a database because it's all built into Rails. So very quickly, this is the code that we've written, just like, or maybe half of it. And I'd like to show you what um, Rails library would be replaced uh, with our current code. So, um, First of all, the daily steps form can be replaced by action view. Action view is the Rails library that works closely with action controller to handle a uh, view template rendering. So this HTML code won't even be in the same file. Um, Rack ser application servers like Puma will do the job of parsing HTTP, the HTTP request and recreating the HTTP responses. Um, action dispatch will parse the HTTP request and route it to route each request to our endpoints. Um, Action Dispatch is the Rails framework that uh, is created to hand, to extend the features of Rack, um, and it handles the routing of endpoints to controllers. Uh, Action Controller, very familiar uh, class, would uh, handle what we call the business logic within the endpoint. In this example, it would be the get action where we get the correct objects to be displayed on our page. Um, and lastly, we have Active Record, which is uh, the Rails library that implements the Object Relational Mapping Framework, um, or ORM. Essentially, Active Record allows us to handle any database interactions and map it to a Ruby object so that it can be used or modified. But yes, this is it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was really useful to you. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, at Ong Maple, 
Thank you and bye. Hello. Thank you. We were discussing on the backstage about your Twitter handle. It should be, oh my God, Mabel, and not that on Mabel. <laughs> because you are such amazing, amazing creature. We have a chat full of comments like, let me read this out loud. Mabel's talk is better than probably 99% of all university courses as an intro to the web. I really like these kind of talks that explains fundamental things in a very practical way. Best presentation award goes to Mabel today. Uh, very nice illustrations, explanatory slides, good presentation. And <laughs> for your next talk, will you be implementing an email server from scratch? <laughs> You are truly amazing. Oh they're, they're actually... <laughs> so we, we hold you accountable of that. Uh, actually, there are... S yes, we book you there. Uh, actually, there's a l so much these praise comments that we have only one question for you. So... How much of these technic technic <laughs> how much of these techniques you use on your daily work, like building something from scratch to understand how it should work? Um, so I would say that this type of knowledge was really helpful for me to understand the yeah. entire system as a whole. So for example, when um, we're working on rails, it's good to understand what really goes um, goes on underneath. Um, so for example, something that I learned working on this is like uh, rack middleware. And uh, on my, in my work in Truffle Ruby, we try to benchmark middlewares in like uh, production code and understanding uh, why we need middlewares and how it's, it gets hooked up to the application is um, something that I found really helpful. Um, after learning, after doing uh, this project, so. Oh, now we have a little bit more questions. We are not letting you go yet. What would it <laughs> look like using Rectors? Have you tried that? No, I haven't. Um, that's actually probably a good idea to uh, to learn about as a follow yeah. up to this uh, project, but I haven't tried it yet. No. So, if you tried that, remember to share the the <laughs> results with us. There's also a request: Can you share a link to repository or quiz with source core code code? Yeah. Yeah, so I actually thought about this. So um, I thought about sharing the code, but I feel like that would be kind of against the spirit of it because I would love for you to actually write it out yourself after learning what I, I mean, after hearing what I have to say. I think it would be really cool if you could like try it out yourselves. Um, but I do have a version of this uh, um, web application or mini web application. Um, linked with a blog post that a similar blog post that I wrote and I can share that but I don't have the link to the code that I uh, used in this talk but this um, is an opportunity to us to create Euroco 2021 challenge to <gasps> oh yes yes so Euroco 2020 21 yes. right um, a Ruby web app, just using using Ruby libraries, nothing else, and and see and see how far we can get with that, and how complicated an app it would be, and how long yes. <laughs> the code would potentially be. That would be super fun. I would definitely be interested. As I said in the talk, feel free to tag me. I would love to take a look. That's good. That's really good. So we can discuss about this challenge idea in Discord. Are you ready for that discussion? Are you yes. ready to jump in 
to this challenge. I hope we can get you, Maple, also to the Discord if you are not already there. And just one question here. Will the code of this simple app be shared on oh, this? We just discussed it also this. It was a question about the sharing the code of this simple app, but the, we discussed it and we decided to do the challenge and you may share something, but you need to build your, build your own app. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I, I can share the slides for sure. Um, I have the slides, uh, the link to the slides, and I'll share it on Discord. That's enough. Yes, that's nice. Okay. And uh, yes, we have a, a more comments on stream chat. Mabel, you have the best t shirt so far. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I really like it. <laughs> I think we all, all agree that Led Zeppelin is a one of a kind of of the bands okay thank you mabel and we will see you on discord thank you. later thank you so much for this it was a really truly amazing talk and 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 presentation